Good evening, everybody, and it gives me great pleasure to be here speaking on this topic with fantastic moderators and a very worthy opponent. This is a topic that is very near and dear to my heart, of course. That what should we do for management of diabetes? Should we just simply keep on treating the age-old philosophy? Let's treat glucose. Let's treat glucose as a number. Or do we really do something about changing this whole paradigm? And let's focus on what is the root cause. In the next several minutes, I shall lead you through this whole story of why, how much weight loss, how do we go about this, who are our targets, and if not, why not? So, as we all know, very familiar with this story, that weight gain or obesity is now increasingly recognized as the main driver of type 2 diabetes, not only in the Caucasian world, but from very good studies done by Dr. Ramachandran in our very own country and several others. Not only is this rate increasing worldwide, but India now faces this twin epidemic of diabetes and obesity, and we are the third largest with the obesity burden. What is this double burden of obesity and diabetes? So I'm just going to show you on this very busy slide the insulin resistance and the beta cell failure that you've been hearing about all day that lies at the core of this type 2 diabetes. So we just spoke about pancreatic diabetes. If there's an insulin secretion defect, maybe weight loss may not work, but we will show you some newer data that may change the way you think. Of course, we all know obesity is not simply linked to type 2 diabetes, but from top to bottom, it affects all your systems. Obstructive sleep apnea, fatty liver, strokes, heart disease, several cancers, infertility, osteoarthritis, no system is left without being affected if you are on the overweight or what we now like to say adiposopathy because you may be normal BMI as in the Indians but you have excess of adipose tissue. I bring you back to Dr. DeFranzo's seminal talk about the twin defects of insulin resistance and beta cell dysfunction and is this the only story what we now know from his lecture that we should always treat our patients in a wholesome manner and try to reverse and get away from this glucocentric approach and move ahead to a more cardiometabolic era. So if you are a treating physician and you will choose weight-centered approach, you can see to the left of your screen, that will be an upstream intervention. If you simply treat glucose, which is to the right of your stream, you have already lost the battle. You're picking up the bones only because that would be a very downstream and glucocentric approach wherein complications have already occurred. Hence, how much weight loss do we need to prevent this? And what will you choose among lifestyle, medications, bariatric surgery, so many options out there. What are we truly talking about? Let's talk about the trial that really changed our mind and thinking. Not only spo it spoke that weight loss could be used as a target for glucose control, but spoke about remission. In the direct trial, which was conducted with about 300 patients being randomized to a control group as well as an intensive lifestyle intervention, at the end of one year, patients who lost about 15 kilograms, almost 86% were in remission of all diabetes medications. At the end of two years, 70% were in remission. Now, if they lost only 10 to 15 kilograms, so less than 15, still a 60% people had remission. And even if you lost three to four kilograms, 5% people of my population, if I can get 5% people to go into remission, that's great with a very minimal weight loss because the remaining still came off a lot of medications. So what worked? We need to think. We need to mimic this. Was it the weight loss or was it the intervention? So Dr. Taylor is a very humble man. He said, yes, there were responders, there were non-responders. And he showed that when you do this weight loss, you are affecting pathophysiology. The liver fat falls, the pancreatic fat falls, glucose stimulated acute insulin secretion returns. What this means is this could be groundbreaking. The beta cell ability to recover function seems to have come back. What is novel? It was done in real life conditions by routine staff, not by specialists. And this is the first study to set remission of type 2 diabetes as a primary outcome measure. Of course, prior to this, there were several smaller studies. What I want to point out to you that in these smaller studies, we saw remission only if the patient lost at least significant 7 to 10%, but they all had improvement in measures 
Also, what we saw is that in most of these trials, including the direct trial, the duration of type 2 diabetes was less than 6 to 8 years. So you want to treat your patients as soon as you see them. You want to really propose this to them and maybe even when they have pre-diabetes. Now let's go and look at outcomes. We always are interested in seeing if we can prevent complications. So in the look ahead study, which is a seminal paper, about 5,000 patients are randomized to an intensive lifestyle intervention versus control condition. Mind you, when I say control, they are getting all the best medications available at the time to control diabetes. Long study, four years. At the end of four years, what do we find? In the intensive lifestyle group who are off medications, about 4.66% weight loss, which correlated with about, what you can see over here, a 7% remission of diabetes, and even at year one, year two, year three, this is maintained, so this is great news for us. Now remember, direct was to look at CV outcomes. If you lose weight and you're an obese and overweight diabetic, what happens to MACE? major adverse cardiovascular events. Anyone know the answer? It was a negative study. It did not reduce MACE. So does weight loss, what I just showed you so far, not do that? Well, again, I'll point out, they did a sub-analysis study and broke down the patients into less than 2% weight loss all the way up to more than 10% weight loss. Subjects, again, who lost more than 10% weight loss, had beneficial decrease in the primary MACE outcome. So again, we know how much weight loss, things to learn by looking at data. So let's switch gears now, because in the interest of time, I can only show you so much lifestyle changes. Medications for weight loss. Now we have medications that cause weight loss, and we have anti-diabetic medications that also cause weight loss. So these are medications that are approved for weight loss. And we know that most of these are not available to us except orally stat. The GLP-1 analogs in much higher doses such as liraglutide and semaglutide showed that patients could have reduction of diabetes and remission even, but when they are stopped, that effect goes away. Now you tell me, is giving a medication, again, what are they doing? Trying to get weight loss, an effective way to do this. I would say my colleague has lost the battle already if he's, that's going to be his point. Now, older medication classes, we know they bring down HbA1c. That's a glucocentric approach, not without side effects such as hypoglycemia, not without side effects such as weight gain, and hence they defy the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes. Will the emerging dual and triple in cretin therapies change my mind? So what we can see at the bottom, it shows you 5% all the way to 30% weight loss. We know the newer molecule terzepatide has now about 18 to 20 percent weight loss. What's in the pipeline for you folks to learn here today? We have cagrilutide plus semaglutide and that may beat bariatric surgery. That may cause a 25 to 28 percent weight loss, but so far bariatric surgery has the highest amount of weight loss. We know from several good studies, so number one is the Stampede trial, wherein medical therapy versus sleeve gastrectomy and RYGB, of course, who won the battle? Patients in the, medical, in the surgical arms had a greater weight loss and remained in remission of type 2 diabetes. And in these studies of bariatric surgery, the patients with type 2 diabetes are even on GLP-1, the best possible medications. So weight loss again. Now, the longest trial we have, Dr. Mingroni's data again. Here you look at BPD, which is biliopancreatic diversion and RYGB, again superior. So what I present to you is the goal for impactful weight loss. At 3%, glucose gets better. Triglycerides get better. Not that bad, your patients can do this. At 5%, HDL cholesterol improves, blood pressure improves, NASH, quality of life improves. At 10% obstructive sleep apnea, at 15% we may have remission of type 2 diabetes, reduction in CV events and mortality. Can you name a single drug that can do this? I dare say you, you won't have anything like this. And hence I present to you that weight loss should be the primary target as a holistic approach, as pay people who care about your patients. But why not? I said why not? Because not everyone responds to lifestyle measures. We know this. We have patients all the time who say they follow diets and they don't lose weight. We need at least a 5% weight loss and only 20% had CV outcome benefits. So we need to understand the non-responders better than the responders. 
I urge you to read this really seminal paper by Dr. Lingue and colleagues for more details. My last slide, weight loss is a holistic approach. As I said, if you're a treating physician like me, you want an upstream intervention to prevent complications. Weight loss, more than 15% can lead to remission and affect CV outcomes. Dare say, is there any medication with similar benefits? And truly speaking, there can be really no side effects of lifestyle. Not only that, since we are not giving any medications, we have no uh, you know, impact on pharma. It's a very green approach for all your patients. So your genes and your environment and lifestyle make who you are. You make your choice. Do you want to stay upstream with me or let your health go down the drain? Thank you very much.